All right, so we're off. So we're going to be talking about heritage foods in Florida. So there are some really amazing programs that are looking at heritage food um, just here in Gainesville. And there's a number of really fascinating organizations. So one of them that I want to highlight is the first one on the left, which is the Florida Heritage Food Program. And this is a collaboration between Santa Fe College and the um, uh, Florida Organic Growers. We'll talk a little bit about that, but they have done an amazing job of just looking at where the Florida community comes from, where in the world have we actually originated as a Gainesville community, and what heritage foods have we brought with us, how do we eat them, how do we connect to them, um, their food and culture events, and lots of education resources. So talk a little bit more about them. Another really great local organization working on heritage and heirloom foods are Working Food. And so that is a great nonprofit that has a culinary incubator, and it also thinks a lot about um, kind of heritage foods of yesteryear, but also breeding the heritage foods of tomorrow. And then one other organization locally that does a lot of amazing work is IFAS Extension. Um, and so there is a lot of really interesting work on that. They talk about ethnic vegetables, which is a framing that, you know, is not necessarily as common as heritage or heirloom crops, but it's an interesting thing to know to look for if you're looking for some of these more unique um, crops that are external. But um, when we're thinking about what all this means, I'd like to take a moment just to explore what heirloom and heritage means. Heirloom and heritage crops kind of there is not a specific definition that is agreed upon by everybody, but there's a lot of common qualities for what they could be. One of them is that the seeds are true to type. So when you grow a seed, you basically know what you're getting. It's a stable uh, crop that's been bred for a long time. So it's you're not going to get a whole lot of crazy varieties. Um, it's open pollinated, which means that you're not... Um, trying to pollinate each flower and do some sort of hybridization. You're just letting the community stabilize itself with either wind or insect pollination. Uh, there's kind of debate as to how long it has to be cultivated to be considered um, an heritage crop. So it can be either, some people say 50 years, some people say 100 years. Some say it's since the development, uh, or it has to have been developed by the end of World War One, or sorry, World War II. So by 1951, anything beyond that, they wouldn't consider that a, an heirloom crop because that is when kind of big scale crop breeding and kind of industrialization of agriculture was happening in the US. Um, Another element is thinking about it being stewarded by a family or a community. And so it, that's actually the idea of the, like, the heirloom, the heritage, you're handing down um, things from one generation to the next. And these precious seeds are, are being kept and stewarded through communities. Um, and then another element is that they're often bred for flavor. And so often the heritage crops or the heirloom crops will be um, a little bit more flavorful, richer, they have local adaptation um, to whatever your climate is, or there's some large cultural significance. So just so we're kind of on the same page as to what we're even talking about here. Another element that comes up in this is the idea of a land race. And so that's a term that is used um, in a kind of different way. It's a very similar set of ideas. And again, there's no exact definition of that, but it has the same ideas of a, a variable population um, so here you might have a little bit more variability than a, a heritage or heirloom crop would be, but it's identifiable, usually as a local name. It lacks a formal crop improvement, but it has a kind of close cultural connection to people um, and to the local place where it was developed. And so, you know, just another term to think about. But while we're thinking about heirloom and heritage crops, I would like to just take a step back real quick. Um, We'll take a step back to about 12,000 years ago with the development of agriculture, because why not go big? Um, and I think as a caveat, I will mention that this is not an area of expertise for me, but it's a really fascinating area. Like, where did we even get all this agricultural biodiversity from in the first place? How does it connect to what we see as heritage now? And so, um, and so I thought it was neat to bring up a cool paper from about 10, 15 years ago that looked at all of the regions of development of agriculture. And it's not just in one place. A lot of folks, when you think about where was agriculture developed, you think of the Fertile Crescent, the Mideast, 
But actually, there were these independent sources of crop development and domestication events all around the world. And often it was in areas of high um, kind of human habitation. It came about 12,000 years ago. It started when the climate stabilized enough that people could stay put and start doing these things. And so there's a lot of really interesting work on that. And I'm happy to share the slides with anyone afterwards. There's some really cool resources if you're excited about this topic that you can dig into a little bit deeper. Um, but some of the earliest development was actually in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, where you got the emmer wheat, you got the einkorn wheat, barley. These things all were happening between developed between 10 to 12,000 years before now. Um, but also in the Far East, you have rice being developed. In um, Mesoamerica, you have maize and a lot of the squashes that we enjoy and beans. And so it's really interesting thinking about where in the world these things originated in the first place. So this is a living topic. So even though this is about like ancient and kind of archeological sites, I think it's kind of cool to know that this science is still being developed. I just found a paper from last year that said that they could trace that evidence that there was cultivation of crops in the Middle East as early as 23,000 years ago. So most people say about 12,000 years ago. These folks are arguing that it could have been 23,000 years ago. Um, and I am gonna give you all 30 seconds to pop in the chat what, what you might think might be the evidence that there was cultivation as early as 23,000 years ago. Any guesses of like what sort of evidence would make you think that maybe that's actually being cultivated um, 23,000 years ago? What do we got? Saved seeds, beer. I don't think they were up beer yet, but seeds, pollen, garden tools, implement seeds. Yeah, so, so those are all really great ideas. And they did actually find um, threshing mechanism, like stone tools that they could use to cut seeds. And they were aware um, things on broken pieces of charred seed that allowed it to last that long. But one of the big things, weeds. So their whole evidence of their paper is based on the fact that there are weeds, which was evidence that there was cultivation. So this is something that people have been struggling with for ages. I just thought it was kind of fascinating and a little bit hilarious that weeds are the evidence of cultivation as early as 23,000 years ago. Um, so another really interesting new paper and or newish 2016 that I thought would be neat to take a look at real quick is looking at the origins of the current global food crop. So we have kind of that big picture of where some of these huge staples come from, but we eat so many things right now. So I thought it'd be great just to take a look at that. And again, I'm sorry that the slides are so funky um, and tiny, but, but basically, um, there was a lot of evolution of like cabbages all over the north, uh, kind of from Northern Europe and then east from there. We have a lot of the beans and tomatoes and chili peppers from Mesoamerica. We have the blueberries and strawberries and pumpkins from North America. And so, you know, the potatoes um, in the Andes and all these amazing sources of global biodiversity and agrobiodiversity. So this next slide, we're not gonna dig into. It is a crazy slide that would take a whole session just to talk about this paper and this slide, but it's from the same paper and it's looking at the big bold things or the types of crops, the number of crops that they developed in that region. And then the lines are showing you where it's being grown around the world right now. And so we are in such a global food system. We are so interconnected. We are so woven together with our shared biodiversity. And I think it's just neat to think about that when we're starting to dig into the importance of heritage crops and why we care. And so just to take a look at agricultural biodiversity on the big picture, it's um, there's been a lot of focus on it and it's a really important topic. And there's everything from like the abiotic factors of the diversity of soils, the genetic sources for, you know, looking at wild type foods that still exist in the world and, and how you can kind of reincorporate some of that genetic diversity, thinking about the diversity of ecological systems and services, and then the implications on socioeconomic and cultural di uh, dimensions. And so agricultural biodiversity is really this super important um, topic that I think is good for us to think about when we're kind of zooming back down into how we steward heirloom crops. Another problem is that we are having loss of it, right? So agricultural biodiversity sparks me. It's super fascinating. It's super exciting. It's a source of culinary and grower joy around the world. 
And, um, but it's, you know, there's a lot of loss. So we have, you know, almost 400,000 species of vascular plants. About 6,000 of those worldwide have been cultivated for food in some way. Um, only about 200 species have, you know, real edible amounts that people cultivate on a large scale. And nine species are really the core um, kind of what people, what's grown is 66% of all crop production. And it's the core of what people eat, what provides calories for folks around the world. And so the species that we're using has really shrunk down to people being reliant on these broad, diverse ecosystems that they eat from to really focusing on nine species. And then on top of that, we also have um, the shrinking of varieties within species. And so this, again, is one of my favorite um, little uh, icons that really shows you how much is lost. So in the 1900s, there was an incredible amount of diversity for each thing. So if you look close, and again, I'm, I'm happy to send this out, um, there were like 408 varieties of peas in these seed catalogs. And at this point, um, there are 25. And so there's this shrinking of the varieties that we have access to because seed houses kind of as they upscaled and industrialized the economies of scale and, you know, some varieties are just a little bit more productive. And so it's easier for them to put all of their, their finances as a um, company into the things that are reliable and uniform and ship well, and they can sell large amounts of, but then we have this enormous loss of this biodiversity um, or agrobiodiversity. And, you know, I think most of us in here, Think of that as a loss, both in terms of adaptability as our climate changes, um, as well as uh, a loss in excitement because people love different things. And so um, it's a loss in so many ways. And so I think what we're thinking about in this session, what we're all doing in our own homes and communities is so important. And so back to some of the efforts going on in Gainesville. Um, there are some, again, really amazing organizations. I gave a quick introduction to them. So we're going to revisit what some of these folks are doing, bring it back again. So the Florida Heritage Food Initiative, um, full title is Connecting Local Food with Local Culture in Florida Farmers Markets. That is a really neat organization. It's USDA grant funded. It was a really great project proposal that they put in. It's led by Dr. Sarah Cervone and Dr. Vilma Fuentes. There's a great website with just a ton of resources. And they help you explore plants by culture. And so you can go to their African collection, to their Asian collection, and see what they have. In each of the places, they talk about the historical significance of the plant, the cultural significance, recipes, growing tips, other resources. So this is a really great resource. If you are excited about kind of heritage and heirloom plants, dig into this resource. Um, they've had events. I think most of the events have probably wrapped up for now, but not a bad idea to kind of check them out and see what might be coming up in the near future. So Working Food also has an amazing array of things. So they have youth gardens and culinary learning. They have a community kitchen, which is an incubator for kind of cottage food products, helping people kind of get off um, and running in their own small cottage food businesses. And then they have the Seed Collective and Plant Program. The director is Melissa Desa, and she does an amazing job, and that whole organization does an amazing job. They curate varieties that thrive in our climate, uh, they do a lot of seed uh, education and growing guides. They've been doing this really cool tomato breeding project. Um, they collaborate with researchers to preserve crop varieties. They've been doing some, some cool work with the Bellevue butternut squash, which is um, open pollinated with the seminal pumpkin. And so it's kind of taking an heritage, a heritage crop and helping it improve a beloved crop that a lot of people want to eat. And so looking at that fusion, and I like how Melissa will often talk about how um, we are breeding the heritage crops of the future. And so right now, as we are adapting seeds to our climate and to our population and our tastes and our excitement, we are creating what generations later, hopefully people will be excited to eat and to preserve and steward into the future. Um, thing I have been very lucky to do is work on a lot of variety trials with working food. And there's some really neat collaborations that have come out of that. We've done mustards, collards, broccoli, um, and have some exciting things on tap in the future. So we'll just go through a couple of those now. So our mustard team, this photo is fuzzy. It's not your eyes, but it was just such a great, joyful 
photo of how much people loved being in the field in these mustards. So mustards are really interesting. They are highlighted on across all three of these sites. Uh, working Food is working on them. Um, the, um, the Florida Heritage Food Project has an, a thing about it because it's also a biblical food. So it's a food that has been um, kind of cited in the Bible. And there are a lot of really neat heritage stories around that. And also IFAS is talking about it being kind of an interesting, high nutrition, easy to grow crop. And so we decided that we were going to see what does well here. And so we have a UF class called um, Project Teams Research. It's ALS 4914. And each time, each class, we take on a different partner and explore something with them. And so we have we were working with Working Food to explore the mustard green opportunities. And so we had two teams. We had the field trial and the flavor trial because people are not going to grow what they don't want to eat. And so it's a really neat class where the students take on this partner and then think about what does the partner want to know? What questions are there? How do you develop research about around that? How do you plan and implement and carry out the research and then communicate about it? So this is a poster that um, Holly Dixon actually led the development of that, one of the, the class folks in the top right, you can see all the class members. Um, and kind of helping with share with the community what it's all about. And so doing this field trials, we had 19 varieties of mustards, we had a hard time narrowing it down. It's easier to do variety trials with slightly fewer than that, but they were also exciting. We're like, all right, we're just going to do the full thing. Um, and so we tried 19 varieties out in the field to see how they did, um, looked at their pest resistance, their bolting resistance, uh, their productivity, all these different factors that help a, a grower decide if they want to grow this or not. And then we also did flavor trials. And so... So for the flavor team, they did both um, new leaf trials as well as older mustard green trials. And we went to some conferences, that bottom right um, picture, you can see them at the, the Global Food Systems Institute conference and had a little taste test, went out to farmer's markets and did taste tests and gathered community ideas about this, looking at the sweetness, the you know spiciness. Um, and they mapped out kind of which people found most delicious, which were the most potent, which were the most bitter. And so this is just an example of their output, but they created this cool, um, the radar chart where you can kind of see across all 19 varieties where things lay. And so the closer it is to the border of the variety, the higher it scored. And so some of them were like super spicy, but often that kind of laid along with people liking them a little bit more. So people kind of enjoyed the bite of the mustards. And then some of them were very mellow, but didn't really taste like much. And so kind of going through that was, was an interesting exercise and some kind of cool results from that. And then the field team research was out in the field and um, everybody did a little bit of everything. Everybody chipped into the whole thing, but they were the ones who took this data and said, okay, how productive was it? How pest resistant was it? If something bolted right away, maybe that's not the greatest thing to grow down here. Um, and so kind of thinking about what makes things exciting for the growers. And then they took both the flavor and the grower um, element and fused it into creating these seed catalog write-ups for, for some of them. And they, they had this fun one. One of the ones that we really focused on was the Feaster family mustard, which is one that Melissa was very excited about. And they've been kind of working with here in Gainesville. And um, they just kind of have these playful write-ups. And so... I love in this class where you take the, the science, the flavor, the creativity of it all and create it into something to help both learn about the crop itself, but also how do you get that into the community and get people to get excited about it. Um, but, you know, for the Southern Giant Curled, for example, not only is this an intricate mustard, a sight for sore eyes, but its flavor lives up to its beauty, bright green with a spicy bite. And so they're just kind of like creative and, and playful. And so it's neat thinking about how do you get people excited about these new crops. So another project that we did was the Heirloom Collar Project. So this was not through a class. This was an internship that we hosted with Field and Fork and with... Um, the um, Melissa at Working Food, and then also connected to this larger heirloom collared project. And this was an amazing example of citizen science. And the way they set this project up is that they had 20 collared that were heirloom varieties that had been saved. Some of them were named after a person and had been like somebody's backyard for many generations. There's a whole variety of, of heirloom collards. And then 
So they set it up so that there were eight sites around the country that grew all 20 varieties in a giant trial. And then they had a citizen science site where they had they sent three different varieties to lots of people. I think there were like 20, 250 citizen scientists who all grew different combos of three different ones. And so you got a lot of kind of backyard gardener data, a lot of large scale trial data and pulled it all together. And so and so here um, we had the student researchers, the two te- um, uh, interns were Kiara Tony and Michaela Bellino, and they helped with the planting and the data collection and looking at how well the crops did. And then we had chefs come out on the left. We have Ashley Rella and, and some other chefs who were out kind of tasting things, like Chef Carl Watts. Um, and so they got to come out and do field tastings and see like, what does it taste like fresh? How do they, what sort of recipes do they think would be interesting for it? And so once again, you have the fusion of the science and the flavor um, and it's just kind of a, a neat, creative way to start exploring the heirlooms of today and tomorrow. And so this was kind of neat because we had all of our data that we pulled together. And um, again, I'm happy to share anything with anybody because there's a lot of really cool information about here about these different varieties. But in this case, everything was sent into the citizen science data um, that was these sites all around the country. And so they got to think through um, on a large scale, what did well where. And so you can actually think about whether some things do better in the Northwest versus the Southeast and what are the most appropriate ones. And I think our data actually um, aligned pretty well, both in terms of the preferred flavor as well as the productivity. So it's kind of interesting also seeing how your tiny micro site plays out on the larger scale. And then back to the um, the IFAS EDIS questions. And so I'm sure, again, all of you have deep familiarity with EDIS, but um, you might not have thought much about looking up the, the idea of these ethnic vegetables. And so with the these um, EDIS publications, they often call it either ethnic or Asian vegetables. And so there's a lot of really cool crops in there. And for each one of these, there's a link. And again, apologies for the tininess of everything, but there's a link in each one and it um, gives you grower guides and when, you know, the soil requirements and just all the stuff that EDIS gives you about how to make things thrive. And so there are all of these Asian and ethnic vegetables that they have tested here and looked at how you can grow them here. So this is a really fantastic resource. Um, to to explore kind of what would you want to try growing next in your garden. And then this is coming up soon, and I am super excited for this. So um, in my last class where we grew 32 varieties of broccoli, um, there was a student who was really excited about variety trials, and he ended up applying for and winning the Florida Climate Institute Student Fellowship. And so he is now a fellow. Um, His photo is not here, but the lead is Leo Ramsey Watson. Um, He's a great undergraduate, super, super excited about this work. And he chose a whole bunch of varieties. In the photo, we have Will Watsonberg, who is one of the students who's going to be helping out as well, and Melissa, who um, they're, you know, fanning all these beautiful amaranth varieties. And so amaranth is a really exciting crop. Some people might know it as callaloo. Um, If you eat the vegetable part of it, it's kind of a common dish in the South, um, or not so common, but semi. Um, There's also the grain amaranth, which is used all over the world um, in dryland farming areas. And it also can be made into this tiny little popcorn. It actually pops, which is kind of cool. And people make, um, you can even just throw it into oatmeal and kind of buff up your oatmeal's nutrition. But you can also make these amaranth patties or these popped amaranth patties. So it's a really cool crop. Um, it grows like a weed for many of us. So if anybody has it, had issues with pigweed, you know amaranth can be very um, excited to live. But... Uh, but that's kind of what makes it potentially a really good crop here in the South. And, um, and it is used for both edible leaves and the seed and beautiful flowers. And so we decided to do a variety trial with that. Um, Lissa has been excited about amaranths for ages. And so Will picked out 15 varieties. We just seeded them like three weeks ago. Uh, on the right, you see where they're at as of two days ago, they are 
already showing their colors and they're very different. And as we were thinning them, we were nibbling them too. And there's already a little bit of a difference in taste in the, the sprout stage. Um, and so it's a really cool uh, crop that could potentially be an important one in the Southeast, especially because it can work with very little fertility and very little um, rainfall. And so um, it is potentially a really good food use, but then we have to figure out how do we get that information out to people. And so we're going to have at the Horticultural Sciences Teaching Gardens, um, Zach Black and Jared Rogers are two of the farm folk out there who manage the, the UF teaching gardens out there. And we're planning a big fall open house. So if anybody is in town and interested, it's going to be probably early to mid-November. Um, if you want to do the QR code to follow us on Instagram, or you could um, just look us up a lot my info on the next page. You can keep in touch and figure out when this event is going to happen, but we'll have tastings. We're hoping to get some of the um, culinary incubator folk to try out the different varieties and see if we can taste differences among the different amaranths. And so we're going to be collecting field data again about which grow well. Some of them should be like 10 feet tall. We have a giant golden amaranth, which should be super exciting and enormous. And then some, um, are a little bit smaller, but maybe more productive. There's all different colors. There's a tricolor one called Joseph's Coat. So it should be really a beautiful demonstration as well as interesting to get to think about the culinary sides and tasting the different elements um, and seeing how they do in the field. And so stay tuned if you're excited about Amaranth because it is going to be beautiful. Um, so that is basically the speed run. I might have gone a little bit quickly through this, but um, that means we have plenty of time for questions. So if you have any thoughts, just to put that out there, if you have you know, general questions, ideas for undergraduate education, you want to just geek out about seeds and cool varieties that we should maybe try next, if there are any organizations that you think would be really cool for us to partner with for this class, um, drop me a line. And you can also look up more about us at the plant science website, plantscience.ifis.ufl.edu. Um, and I am going to say thank you with that and take lots of questions. It looks like there's been a whole lot of chatter in the chat box and I, I'm excited to get up with that. Um, and so we'll just kind of jump into it. Um, when we're doing this kind of breeding, Gabrielle Clark asks, would this follow under would this fall under GMO foods? Yeah, that is a good question because with all the heirloom discussions, um, it would not. So GMO is something where you're going in and you're actually genetically modifying. So there's standard breeding, which is you have plant A and you plant plant B and it's like Mendelian breeding. You're like, oh, I like the traits in that one and I like the traits in that one. And I'm going to like get their flowers together and, and help them breed and, you know, see what naturally comes out of it. GMO is using kind of genetic manipulation techniques where you're changing it and you're like inserting a gene into a different crop. And so it's a completely different thing than just like standard horticultural breeding. And so GMO crops are not considered heirloom crops and they are also not part of this story here. And I am not totally anti-GMO because I think that there are some good things that can be done with it. Like some of these kind of high vitamin A um, I think right. there's a rice, the golden rice that helps cure blindness in places. So there's a lot of, it's a tool that I think can be used well if it is used carefully, but I think it does need to be monitored and um, managed pretty carefully. But that is not part of the heirloom conversation. That's just like good old fashioned breeding and um, has to be a stable population for at least 50 years. Okay. So. Um, Linda asks, how do we support more heirloom varieties in stores as a consumer? And then she says the tomatoes taste terrible at the store. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I think it is a challenge on the grocery store scale. Um, I think that they are inherently always going to be going for the things that are shelf stable, that ship easily. And those are the things that have been bred and kind of produced en masse. Um, there are some smaller stores like Wards that will carry some heirloom things and we can kind of try to encourage it. I think 
going to farmers markets and supporting your local farmers is, I would say, the number one best way to support this, what's grown locally and with the people who are actually investing their time and blood and sweat and tears and love into to stewarding these populations. I think, um, you know, so supporting your farmers and your local farmers market, supporting um, seed saving organizations and buying your seeds from places where they're breeding them locally to adapt to your climate, both is better for your garden, but also supports the whole movement. And I always think it's good just to talk to the produce manager at the grocery store and say, hey, have you thought about getting heirloom stuff? I mean, I think consumers do have a lot of power and there might be um, some room depending on who's in charge of that grocery store, or maybe they'll listen and be like, oh, there's a demand for this. Let's try to make it work, even though it's a little bit more challenging. Um, so those are, are my thoughts on that one. Yeah. Um, and I'm, um, This is an interesting question. I don't want you to take it wrong. Um, Susan was hoping for some more specific um, advice on how to be successful with heirlooms in their gardens, tomatoes, beans, cubes, et cetera. And then Maria, and a corollary question says, are heirloom vegetables better or pest resistant? And I think that Dina's going to have an interesting reply to both of those. So. <laughs> um, I think that, yes, it is always an exciting challenge figuring out how to tackle a topic like this because um, there are so many heirloom vegetables and you could just focus in on one or two. I kind of took a step out of like, hey, what's the whole topic about? Um, I think for getting specifics on how to do it better, I would say go to the IFAS EDIS sites where they give you in-depth recommendations about each of these crops. Go to the seed saving catalogs where they have these heirloom crops and often they'll have little guides for them. Um, and so I think there's a ton of information out there. Um, and Wendy, I'm sure you have information as well as that. You might want to respond to that. In terms of the um, are they more pest or disease resistant? Not always. Um, often a lot of the breeding is uh, done to address that. So a lot of these newer varieties actually do address the diseases and the pests that we're seeing right now. And so that is the beauty of, of having all these different tools in your toolbox. You know, if you have a lot of issues with downy mildew, maybe you do want to buy one of these more modern, you know, downy mildew resistant basil varieties. Or So I, I think that there is a role for newer developed breeding. Um, but I think that a lot of the heirloom crops are bred for flavor, for cultural significance, not necessarily to resistance. And as a byproduct, some of them will be better adapted. Like the seminal pumpkins do great down here where a lot of other cucurbits are like, oh my God, this is terrible. Um, and so I think that sometimes a byproduct of having kind of been domesticated and stewarded in the place for a long time, they will be more resistant, but that isn't across the board. And so I'm going to toss it over to you, Wendy. To see I think, anything. you know, I mean, the my mantra, right? This is my tattoo, right plant, right place. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, I don't really have a tattoo, you guys. Uh, <laughs> But uh, if I did, that's what it would say. But, you know, so there there are these, um, like some tomato heirloom, heirloom tomatoes, like Mortgage Lifter, Black Crim, White Amish, Brandy Wine. And you read the descriptions in the seed catalogs and you're like, oh, I'm all about that. And we bring them down to Florida and they just melt and disappear. So like Dina and the students in partnership with Melissa were doing trials. You can try some of these and listen to your fellow gardeners and uh, get on, um, get into organizations like the Master Gardener Program and find out about, um, you know, which ones are working. Because I would never suggest uh, brandy wine um, for for me in Gainesville, but maybe someone's had better luck with it up in the Panhandle or um, you know different places. But I can grow the heck out of um, out of the Everglades tomato, <laughs> so that's something to think about. Um, so that's I, something that um, Melissa's been working on. There is that tomato breeding project where they're doing the Evie tomato and they're taking these Everglades tomatoes that are super resistant and cross breeding them with different varieties that are maybe larger or more, you know, flavorful in some way and trying to come up with what's what's our new heritage crop going to be in 50 years. And so trying to to adapt it to your environment. 
Right. Yes, and um, people are wondering what would be a good source of seeds for different heritage uh, veggies. And I think that um, many of the big catalogs do earmark it. But Dina, do you have a favorite or is anything you've noticed? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really neat ones out there. Um, I do love the Working Food Southern Heritage Seed Exchange. They have some great stuff. Um, not off the top of my mind. I think the Baker Heirloom Seed. Southern Heritage Seed Exchange. Exchange. Southern Heritage First. Seed Exchange, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I could be misspeaking it, but... Um, but yeah, there's Baker Creek seeds. There's um, Baker Creek is good. Yeah, there are a number, and I'm I would have to look them up. I don't remember off the top of my head, but if you just look up heirloom seed catalog, there will be a lot that pop up. So definitely, that's for sure. And it's again finding out the right ones. Um, and uh, there's some questions about amaranth. Uh, mm -hmm. and how is amaranth used? So it is, um, it is a basically a culinary and a floral product. And so you can eat the leaves and cook it up and kind of eat it like a spinach um, or kalalu, I mentioned. Uh, you can also eat the grain, which is really nutritious and high in protein. And, um, and again, you can make those tiny little popcorns out of them. So, so yeah, it's edible and it's also beautiful in the gardens. And it's very hearty for the most part. But again, we'll see which ones do best down here because pigweed does great, but maybe some of the culinary varieties will have variation in how they, they thrive here. So Yeah. Um, and then somebody else mentioned uh, they were having trouble growing amaranth in um, on southern Florida or on the coast in southern Florida over in the Indian River area. Um, I have never had any trouble growing it. Or, or what has been your experience? I have not done a bunch of it yet. Um, this is why this is so exciting. I mean, I know um, Melissa has talked about kaolu popping up in her compost piles, but they haven't planted it. Like it, it can pop up everywhere. Some of the coxcomb solutions are a little bit less... Um, animated in their growth they they struggle a little bit more here they don't get as big or as robust um uh, stay tuned and, and check in and we'll see how it goes uh, um someone says sounds like amaranth could be its own webinar i think that might be true maybe later on down the road when you all have your um your um results yeah, that'd be great. Or come on out. I mean, there's not, there's no replacing seeing it in the field. Um, and again, some of these golden amaranth giant ones, again, you know, like ten feet tall. It's going to be a glorious sight, assuming we don't kill them. But. Now, Janice um, has a lot of experience with um, with amaranth and a lot of um, heritage vegetables. She she says it grows like a weed for her and acts as a trap plant for uh, for pest. So as a, um, a kind of part of IPM, you know, planting a trap trap or a trap plant or a crop where people, where the pests try to move through and then they can't get to your plants. So, yes, but, which is great if you're trying to protect other things, not so great if you're trying to grow the amaranth. Um, but, you know, maybe it's something that if you have a secondary crop, then you, you know, plant it next to it and try to to harvest what you can before it gets all the pests and then take it down and, and trap all your pests. So, um, Jose Serrano wants to know, do heirlooms have more nutrition? You know, I think it would depend on the crop and the variety. Um, I know a lot of that depends on the soil health as well. I don't know offhand. I, I would imagine that that's super variable. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, but I would think it depends on what it's been bred for. Um, and also some of the slower growing things sometimes have more time to incorporate if you're growing like a ton of biomass real quick, which some of the the more modern breeding methods have created those probably don't have the time to take up as much of the nutrients. So there might be some difference there, but I actually am not sure. Yeah. Um, some other sources for heritage seeds, people have recommended um, seed swaps at their library, seed libraries in your own local spot. 
Um, and then James Norman said the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage South African American Corridor might have some amaranth and stuff. So that's, um, those are, there are um, a lot of sources out there and Southern Exposure also. Um, and, and do you have a Facebook page for the teaching garden to follow for announcements or? So uh, the teaching not actually have its own Facebook page yet, although we are planning to, to make one hopefully at some point. Right now, the plant science program would be the way to do it. So if you look up the UF plant science major, then you can follow that Facebook page. Or um, if you're an Instagram user, you could use the QR code that I sent out and or look us up at UF plant science major and follow on Instagram. And we'll put announcements on both those sites um, as well as on our website. So when the time comes, we will share broadly. Okay, well, that field day, I would really like to be able to share that information out with people. Yes, so, we have not set a time or anything, but once we do know that, we'll yeah, know. please let me know so yeah. the folks who are in our area could plan on coming by and um and seeing that. Because or maybe those who aren't can you know make a field trip, come come try out some amaranth. So Becky and her um, magic ways has posted the Facebook for the UF Plant Science. Um, if people want to check, click on that in the chat box. It's over there. So I'm going to ask you a hard question. Um, someone's, how do you make mustard leaves more appealing to, for people to eat? Um, that's a hard question, but someone said mustard leaf on a sandwich instead of lettuce. Yum. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have any uh, suggestions for preparation of mustards? So um, the taste test. Yeah, yeah. So they did both the raw taste test. And so we got a lot of people eating raw mustard leaves, which was <laughs> a little bit hilarious, maybe a tiny bit cruel, but kind of cool to get that feedback about just like what the raw leaf does. Um, but there's lots of cooking things. Um, the students came up with some really neat recipes. One of them was to use it instead of spinach in a spanakopita. And so they made kind of a, a spicy spanakopita. Um you know, just stewed mustards can be really tasty. There was a chef who was trying to take one of the spiciest ones. There was one that just like tasted like wasabi and it kind of blew all of our minds. And so he tried drying the leaf and grinding it up to see if you could use it like a wasabi paste. And it actually lost its spice through the drying process, which was kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, people did wraps in them, um, steamed them and, and wrapped things up in them. Um, I mean, they there's a lot of good stuff coming in the chat box. Uh, uh, Jenny says broth and garlic. Lacoma says garlic. People are saying bacon and onions. Um, turkey, uh, turkey burgers in put it in the turkey burgers. That sounds great. I'm hungry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then someone said uh, a little bit of baking soda in the broth. Uh, quick saute and safflower oil. Inger says fried, and I have had that's awesome. Someone suggests making a pesto. So oh, that would be a, a spicy pesto, but I like the idea. Maybe you like mix it with something else and it's not pure mustard pesto. Um, but yeah, it's really endlessly so many options and it is a very high nutrition project product. And then also they are trying to breed out some of the bitterness, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there are, because it has such high nutrition profile, I mean, it's one of the more nutritious greens. Um, and yet a lot of people don't like it because of the bitterness or the spiciness. Um, there are efforts right now looking to breed out the bitterness of it. And so we, the class spoke with a seed breeder and their questions to him are like, well, once you create this, is it going to be super expensive? Who's going to have access to it? Like it brings up the whole intellectual property of the non heirloom varieties and, and kind of how you access them. A little bit of honey. Honey, that sounds yeah. fun. And then the other says use the young leaves. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. But yeah. in the South, the best thing is the bitterness of the mustard green. I kind of agree with that too. I mean, apparently bitter is getting a culinary revolution. People are, are excited about, you know, bitter flavors these days. So good. Um, Bronwyn recommended Sista seeds, true love seeds and Southern exposure for hair heirlooms. I hadn't heard of true love seeds before. So that's awesome. No need. Yeah. Some good sharing going on. Chopped on pizza. People, master gardeners love to um, cook and share too, which is. Yes. Great. Maybe we make a cookbook together, you know, mm -hmm. just for a master's cookbook. I, well, how about just a exchange? Uh, 
but some of the counties do make a comp uh, combined um, cookbook and share recipes that way. Yeah. Um, so where is the horticultural sciences demo garden? So that is on the UF campus. Um, it is just south of Fifield Hall. Uh, so it is on Hall Road. I'm happy to to share a map link later as well. well so but the people who are familiar with the greenhouse complex where we have the poinsettia field day, it's in that zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so just on the Alice. south side of Lake Alice. Okay. Right okay. by the baseball stadium, actually, across the street from the baseball awesome. stadium. That is a, that's a pretty good, easy to find uh, identifier there. And we have not planted them yet, so they are not available to be seen just yet. But hopefully they'll be in the ground by the end of next week or early the week after. And then we'll be off and running. And we'll, we'll post updates of how they're coming and um, share it on Instagram and Facebook as the project develops. Um, you know, um, some there folks did mention. I didn't want to let you know this that you mentioned something about Joseph's coat, or mm -hmm. so the, we have a plant that's called Alternanthera um, that also is called Joseph's coat. But what mm -hmm. you're talking about is the Joseph coat variety of amaranth. So Correct. I don't want people to get those two things confused because the Alternanthera is not edible and the amaranth is. Apologies, thank you for screaming that out. And yeah, the common name adventure is always interesting. So this is amaranthus tricolor, I believe. So it's a it's an actual amaranth. It just is a variety called Joseph's coat because it's yellow, green, and red, and it's it's supposedly beautiful. We'll see I how can't it wait out. to see it. It's going to be fun. Um, so um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your slides with us, so we'll make we'll turn those into a PDF. We'll post them um, with the recording. And so for the folks who didn't get the big version, you'll you'll have a recording. Hopefully that'll be a little bit bigger. And then we'll have the, all the slides and you will be able to see them there. And then um, if you need to contact Dina, um, we'll have her information will be on that top slide. And I think um, somebody really liked the slide that showed the origins of agriculture. She'd like to share that with some of the uh, elementary school students that she works with. So. Yeah, so the link to that paper is on there. There's, I, I tried to link all the resources because there's some really cool work going on. It's like lifetimes of work that go into this this hunt of agricultural biodiversity. But um, but that's one of my favorite papers, so I highly recommend taking a look at it. It's all <laughs> that, that faculty members doing. So we'll be good. Doing all stuff. right, Dina, thank you so much for being with us, and um, have a wonderful semester. I know you're working with some fantastic students, so. We look forward to seeing the, the latest on the amaranth coming up, and hopefully we'll have you back for a little bit more information on that going forward. And hopefully I will have my technological glitch fixed by then. Apologies for the, the extra complexity of this, but it was a pleasure to get to talk with you all, and please do reach out and follow up with us if you have any thoughts or have ideas of cool organizations to connect students to. We're always looking for opportunities for students to to do experiential education and internships and um, connecting with jobs. So keep me in mind if, if anything like that pops up. Always happy to and if, they, if you, if anybody out there knows of an amazing, promising horticultural student or plant science student, Dina is their, one of their contacts on UF campus. She's happy to talk to them, right, Dina? Yes, please bring us, bring us all your interested undergrads because plant science is a bit of a found major and people don't know that there's this whole world of plant science that they can have careers in. And so there's a cool site called seedyourfuture.com, um, which helps students explore what kind of careers there are with horticulture and plant science, but it still is mysterious for a lot of students coming into undergrad. So the more they know that there is there is work in this super exciting, amazing field full of passionate people. I, I think the more we can get that word out, the better. So, thank you. All right. Well, we'll see you next time, Dina. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Betty.